The two-tier system of justice, this sort of deep state, is not just in the halls of justice and courtrooms. It's here in Congress, in our constitutional oversight. When you have individuals who are subpoenaed, who are holding senior positions in government, and they violate those subpoenas by not producing the documents constitutionally they owe to Congress under threat of subpoena, not threat of subpoena, under the authority of a subpoena, and they violate them continuously, you're, you're eroding the Constitution. You're setting it on fire. I mean, Congress has all but ceded its constitutional oversight authority to the executive branch that's supposed to report to them. The, these folks like Garland and Ray have come in and made it almost beneath them to go over there and testify. And then it takes an, a literal act of Congress to get one document from one subpoena and it's 60% redacted. So the question is, why is Congress allowing this to occur? They've done some great work. There's been some brave whistleblowers. Don't get me wrong. And a lot of these people are people I used to work with. Um, but the amount they've left on the field, in my opinion, has, has left constitutional oversight and tatters in Congress. And you know, maybe that's one thing the new speaker can perform better on. Um, I just remember being a target of the Jan 6 committee and the first guy subpoenaed by it. And I have no problem with that. They could have just asked me to come in and I would have come in and told the truth. That's your job. But how they went after people who didn't show up for subpoenas or didn't cooperate or who didn't produce documents was drastically different than what we've seen these last 10 months. And so that's why I just think I thought in the last check was a judiciary, but that's a different conversation. Different in that, you know, they were very serious about doing it or. Well, they were I think they were overly aggressive. I think I think those committees abused their constitutional oversight authority to personalize and politicize and sort of mete out a weaponized system of justice from Congress. Um, but they also showed you what the actual authorities are if you were you to use them appropriately. And I haven't seen a lot of those authorities utilized here. And I talk about one in particular fencing, taking pockets of money from agencies and departments that are not doing the mission, that are not serving Congress's subpoenas that they've lawfully ordered and not providing the witnesses that Congress wants to talk to. And a lot of it always keeps coming back to the central note of, you know, how is that going to reflect in a current election cycle? And that's not uh, the role of the executive branch to make that decision. So, you know, I, I really, have, I've told members of Congress, I said, you need, you're doing some great work, but you really got to go all in and get aggressive because a lot of America has realized over these years that you are responsible for keeping these agencies and departments in check. And when you don't, the system fails. And a lot of the media is okay with that because it advances a certain political narrative. And I think that's completely destructive to our constitutional republic. Mm -hmm. You know, this fencing of money, um, we've discussed it now a number of times. I keep thinking about it, frankly ever since, you know, frankly, ever since you applied it, this was before we met, right? <laughs> and while you're still working for House Intel. Um, but it just, I think, I mean, I can't, can't, was it applied once? Were there other instances? I can't even remember it. It really, it really isn't something that's been used, but it seemed to be very effective. Yeah, and whether it's fencing, that's just a congressional terminology, or another me mechanical maneuver in Congress to pocket some, to, Kate, to take pockets of money, you know, you need the speaker's permission and we only got it once, but we saw thousands of documents come in the next day. So it worked. But this Congress, you know, when they issue these new CRs, these new budgets, they haven't trimmed any of the fancy government funded private jet rides or any of this. And I'm not talking about defunding the police or the FBI or the DOJ. I'm the guy that tells you you can't do that. But I'm the guy that tells you there's waste, fraud, and abuse there. And why is this guy flying away on vacation on a G5 we pay for? Like you can't you can't take that line item out of the budget and ground the jet until he at least complies with all the subpoenas that are out there. You can't say, no, you FBI are not going to get a new headquarters department that's twice the size of the Pentagon in Maryland until you reform this FBI. I mean, this is this is simple stuff. And it, it begs the question, why hasn't Congress acted? Um, they have the power of the purse, and I don't think they've used it um, to maximize constitutional oversight. It's another thing I talk about in the book. So what's your theory? 
Uh, on where it goes? No, your theory on uh, why. Um, I think a lot of it revolves around the lobbyist industry and the defense industrial complex. A lot of it is, look, fundraising for campaigns. You know, what, what PACs are getting money from who and what companies and, you know, are the Amazons and Googles and Facebooks and Twitters of the world and every small company on down underneath them. They're spending money to make sure laws go in place that help them increase their bottom dollar. And that's part of the American process. But I think it's overtaken um, the powers that members of Congress should be executing because they're beholden to these companies for that financing, for that funding um, to be reelected. And I and I think it's just gotten completely out of control. Well, so the so the book is out. I, I have to say I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, I hadn't realized um, how important your adventure, or our adventure at Cassius Corner was to yeah. helping kind of set up the broad swaths mm -hmm. and, and themes and so forth. So it was, it was, it was great. It was, it was a, a pleasure and an honor to see that. Um, so I guess you know, we, we talked a bit about it. It took a long time. <laughs> To, uh, you were done a lot, yeah. a lot earlier, and we uh, thought it would be published a lot earlier. Yeah, so it, it, it's you're right. Cash's Corner was critical epoch, and the team here was that was the fun part. You know, talking about every week, sitting down, what I did, what we can do better, and how we go forward. And we were able to stitch the book together in relatively short order. I think we wrote it in about three to four months. Final, like you know, wire to wire, to the to the manuscript, final manuscript. And what really this goes back to a central point of the book, the deep straight, the administrative state is in just random places of government. So there's a book review process if you have a security clearance, which I'm all for. If you leave government, you submit the manuscript back, and it takes two to three months. They want to make sure no private information has slipped or classified information. I got that. I used to be on that side doing it. It's totally fine. Ten months later, I mean, this is what happens. Your manuscript is frozen, by the way. So when you submit it, and I submitted it now, the book is out in October of this year, I had finished my manuscript in October of last year. Just think about that for a second. Couldn't change it. But they wouldn't let me release it up until now. I had to file a federal lawsuit against the Biden administration and the nine agencies and departments they sent my manuscript for review. That's unheard of. It goes to the last station of service. For me, it would have been DOD. They sent it to eight more. When we pressed them on it, Oh, there's a lot of classified stuff. We got to review this. You're talking about this operation in Baghdadi and Soleimani and hostages. And okay, well, you know, with my background, I think I was competent enough to make sure I didn't put in classified information. But if I did, just tell me what it is, block it out or I'll delete it and we'll move on. So at, after we finally filed the lawsuit, it was shocking to see how fast they worked then, they submitted it. And I think the math count on it is less than 0.05% of my book is redacted. And the words that are redacted, and I'll be able to tell you someday, me and my attorney literally were laughing out loud. <laughs> Which means to us, we knew the whole thing was a, a setup, a delay tactic. Because what they, delayed, uh, what they redacted is completely meaningless. And so we just said, we'll accept these. And I actually, for the first time, I don't think anyone's ever done this in the history of like government review. I took DOD's letter and I pasted it right into the front of the book so the American public can see what they tell you needs to be done and how they delayed the book. Um, and, uh, I'm just glad it's out. It's, it's, I don't know that I'll do it again, Jan. Um, but, uh, I'm very thankful to the team at Epoch for making that a reality because it's hard to sum up 16 years. <laughs>